All right, hello, welcome to the Off By One security stream, if anyone is out there. So that's the great thing about doing these streams is like I could either do it to where I record them and then just post videos like a lot of folks do, or I can do it where I'm streaming it on Fridays at 11 Pacific time and then whoever wants to check in and do comments and stuff like that and have a little interaction uh, that opportunity is there and otherwise it just goes to being recorded on YouTube and available for uh, future folks to watch. So I wanted to do a uh, presentation or stream on introduction to Linux heap internals. And as you can see, I'm, I'm always fancy as usual with the uh, with the big intro and all the like moving animation and all that. I'm joking clearly. I really don't care about all that. I just want to get straight to the content um, I'm using today an an older system this is like a, a windows 7 box but it's got vmware running on it and it all works fine because my other computers are tied up i've got like a, all my systems right now thrown at my fuzzing farm uh, because they're they're finding some interesting stuff right now so i'm throwing all the power i have at that so i'm using an old system today which is fine because i've got what i need on here with vmware i did a poll which was asking if i'm going to do a presentation on the linux heap or heap in general what particularly would be of interest to you and it probably introduction to heap internals is what won the poll so i'm going to do that i'm also going to sprinkle in a couple of things here and there i'm not sure how far we'll get in this session i i want to cover some basic things like structures on the heap and heap memory management and some of the different um, differences and similarities between different allocators out there and and see where we get to. We'll do a little bit of debugging. I think that'll be helpful. And I've been getting a, quite a few DMs on Twitter or comments here and there about some different stream ideas people would like to see. Uh, some people are like, can you do one on poem tools and how to get started with that? Or uh, someone I think just posted today, can you do one on introduction to WinDebug or getting into that and, and how to use it for uh, debugging crashes and such. So lots of good ideas coming in. Um, there's certainly a, a never ending list of topics that we could cover, but I think the heap is a good one because what I've experienced when teaching classes is that a lot of people have experience on the stack maybe and how stack memory management works and all that. And, and with stack exploitation, at least on like Windows and Linux, slowly coming to an end. And I know that's like something that's been said for 20 plus years now. I actually am starting to believe it. Like I remember when this was said in the late 90s, early 2000s, that stack exploitation was coming to an end, that buffer overflows wasn't gonna be pop possible anymore. And I didn't believe it. And you know, here we are 20 years, whatever later, and it's still possible. But with the introduction of control flow enforcement technology and shadow stacks and things like that, I really do think it's coming to an end along with things like return oriented programming. Uh, when you when you start doing things like having a copy of a return pointer on a hardware controlled protected stack so that if someone does a buffer overflow and overwrites the active stack return pointer, it's not going to match what's on the shadow stack. So unless you've got some kind of hardware vulnerability potentially that allows you to also modify the hardware stack, it's going to be kind of difficult to do that. Along with um, and that, you know, that goes straight into return oriented programming as well. If you're doing ROP you're relying on the RET instruction. And yeah, you can do jump oriented and other flavors of oriented programming, but with the original ROP, that's gonna be dead because the shadow stack, if that protection is turned on, it's not gonna be possible to make a copy of all your ROP gadget pointers on the shadow stack, uh, unless there's some kind of vulnerability that we don't know about. Uh, along with some of the other control flow enforcement technology stuff where uh, one of them is the new end branch instruction, which says if you're returning to a caller, the address you're returning to must hold an end branch instruction. So that's really going to hinder or significantly impact the ability to do ROP because you can't just return back to any old code sequence. It's got to be a return to an end branch instruction, which is going to take the available ROP gadget down you know, to a small, small, small fraction of what it used to be. So these types of controls are why I'm saying that the death of Stack Overflows is finally upon us. Now, if you go and look at a, a Windows system, for example, and you bring up Exploit Guard, Shadow Stacks is not enabled by default because most of the processors out there that we're using don't support it. 
And so as we slowly get to a point where more and more systems are, are supporting shadow stacks and things like that, then Microsoft could potentially make that switch to turn it on. But it's kind of like, remember when DEP came out, DEP came out and data execution prevention came out back with Windows XP Service Pack 2 way back in 2000, I guess three maybe. And, um, and so when that came out, Microsoft didn't just turn it on for everything by default. They turned it on for Windows essential services or whatever only. And then you had the option to turn it on for everything and then have a, a list of applications that you want to opt out. So when we get to the point, like I was just saying, where most systems have support for that technology, then, then it can turn it on. So stack overflows will still be possible until we get to that point. So it's not like dying overnight or anything, but we're definitely, you can see, I guess, however you want to look at it, the light at the end of the tunnel from a security perspective as to why that and ROP is not going to be possible. And there are a myriad of other mitigations that you all know about, address space layout randomization and so on and so forth that are a control flow guard that are greatly impacting the ability to be able to exploit these vulnerabilities. Compilers are a lot smarter. So, okay, enough on that. I just wanted to rant a little bit about that just to demonstrate why stack exploitation, you know, we got to start moving away from that. It's already kind of hard to pull off anyway. So the heap, I found that most of the times when I'm teaching or doing a session that a lot of people don't have foundational understanding of the heap. And of course, you need that foundational level of understanding in order to be able to uh, move into heap exploitation. Now, heap exploitation has been around forever, right? Way old papers like... If you go out to Shellfish and How to Heap, you see old papers like the Malik Malificarum from Phantasmal Phantasmagoria. And then like a, a updated version of that that came out years later in like 2005. And then newer techniques uh, that have come out over the years dealing with like Tcash bins and Tcash poisoning. And just the, the techniques are more complex as we move into more modern implementations of glibc. And they're also more like conditional where, yeah, you could come up with a proof of concept that shows that if the planets or stars all align in a very specific way, that you could theoretically pull off this style of attack. And, and that's true. But, um, but in most cases, that's not going to be possible. So I think we're also going to see we're going to get to a point where the day of, of techniques working, and by techniques, I mean okay, if, if you want to return to libc, you can do that. Solar Designer came out with that back in the early 2000s. And the idea was overwrite the return pointer with the address of a function from a loaded library and pass it the arguments. And that way you're getting around depth because you're not doing code execution on the stack or something. You're doing code execution in a code segment. You're just passing the, the arguments to a function that wasn't supposed to be called. And it was a cool way that worked quite well. Um, that's a technique. Pop, pop, ret against the 32-bit Windows structured exception handler overflow was a technique. Pop, pop, ret. Like that's a well-known true technique. Um, ways to exploit look aside list or fast bins. Those are techniques. And so what I was getting to is that those techniques are going away. So what you're going to see is one-off exploits that were exploited in a certain way because a lot of times, believe it or not, the, the planets or stars do align in such a way that allows for exploitation to be possible. So I think you're going to see a lot of one-off techniques. So let's jump into the heat now. So the stack versus the heat. The stack gets utilized every time a function call is made. So every function call gets its own stack frame allocation that's happening dynamically. It's happening automatically through whatever calling convention you selected during compile time, the stack frames being built in a specific way, but it's compiler inserted code that a developer doesn't have to worry about. It happens automatically. So there's something called the procedure prologue that builds the stack frame. And there's something called the procedure epilogue that tears down the stack frame. And it's just a couple instructions. If the stack frame is being used, it says push the stack point or the base pointer onto the stack to become the save frame pointer that restores the base pointer when you go through your epilogue, and then you've got the uh, the next instruction. It says move 
the stack pointer address into the base pointer. So you're basically telling the base pointer to point up to where the stack pointer is pointing. And then you do your buffer allocation. So that's like the stack epilogue, frame epilogue, and then, or the prologue. And the epilogue happens when we tear it down. So I'm just rambling through that because that's not what we're talking about today, but I'm just throwing it out there. Every function call gets a stack frame. It's automatically built from compiler inserted code. And a, a function calls a finite amount of time. We call a function, we get in and we get out. It doesn't remember anything. There's no persistence or anything. It will do what you asked it to do. And then it returns back control. Sometimes it returns back a status code and the accumulator register. Sometimes it returns back a pointer to a memory allocation, whatever that function was supposed to do. But it's finite. You get in, you get out, you move on. We use functions so that we don't have to repeat our code all over the place. So that being the case, stack frames are there for a very short amount of time and they're set up and torn down. What about when we need more dynamic memory? What's an example of needing dynamic memory? I'll just give a silly one, not silly, but just an, an easy one. If you bring up Chrome and you've got a tab open and you're looking at a PDF document in the Chrome tab, the memory that's allocated to store that file that you're viewing is going to be there for how long? That's that's the question. We don't know how long. However long the user leaves that tab open with the URL pointing to that PDF document. So it's not finite really in the same way as we talk about on the stack. It could sit there. You, if you look at someone's iPhone and you look at their Safari app and you look at the number of tabs open, most people have like 50, 60 tabs open because it's just easy to bring up a new window and, and go to a new page. So that memory stays there allocated. And then if we change the URL and we say, instead of the PDF document, I'm gonna to go to the Google homepage, then that memory needs to be freed. It needs to be freed and given back to the heap manager so that that memory can be recycled or reused. Now, sometimes there might be a case where the process that's running gives memory back to the kernel to make it available for other processes that are running. In a lot of cases, that's not that's not happening. That would be some optimization techniques I'll get a little bit into later on if we have time. Um, I'll give an example of like Jason Evans Malik, J.E. Malik, when he got hired by Facebook um, as to an optimization technique that I, I saw him lecture on. So what is determining on the heap when that memory is to be free? There are different ways or different times that memory is gonna be freed in relation to the heap. Obviously, if you kill a process, the whole process dies, that memory gets sent back. But if the process is running, what's gonna manage that? Well, you could call the free function and the free function pass it a pointer to the pages or the, the, the um, allocation, the objects, and it will free those and it will give them back to the heap manager so that they can be reused. That's one way of doing it. Or there might be more a dynamic tracking of memory, something if you if you saw an earlier uh, stream that I did, I talked about browser exploitation and we talked a little bit about C++ object management, memory management, and how you could use something called smart pointers. And smart pointers, there's different ways that smart pointers are going to track dynamically the objects that are in use. And then when that object is no longer needed, it frees it. And the question was, well, how does it know that an object is no longer needed. This was something where I mentioned to that stream that we could exploit the behavior of that due to Microsoft's choice of how smart pointer implementation was, was going and other factors as well. And then they came out with the mitigations, MemGC and isolated heap that really did a great job killing that bug class in a lot of cases. So we can have a reference counter and every time a new add ref function call was made because a new reference was needed to an object, we could increment this reference counter. And then when a release function is called because we no longer need a particular reference, we can decrement the reference counter. And once the reference counter hits zero, we can, we can free the object and it goes back. But there's ways to maybe trick the reference counter into prematurely freeing something. That's where we got into use after free. So, Okay, let's say we're not using smart pointers. 
how are objects in memory then being tracked? How does a dynamic memory allocation know that it's no longer needed? Well, you can call the free function, but how does it know when the free function is to be called? There has to be some kind of indicator or action or criteria that has to be met. The example I gave already was if I go to the URL of a browser and I change the page from a PDF document URL to the Google homepage, that's some action that's that's occurring that should result in the freeing of the memory that's no longer needed anymore. But I've seen plenty of other problems where like, okay, if, if we if we have an object in memory or some memory that's allocated and, and we still want that allocation, but we're resizing that allocation, we can call a function like realloc or heap realloc. And that's gonna change the size, which often results in a memory move function allocating memory somewhere else and moving whatever in that object you still want to have to a new location. And then it's supposed to go back and free the old memory, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Complex applications, it's hard to find bugs like that. And when you find them, going back to what I said previously about techniques, sometimes you can use those techniques that are like standard techniques on how you exploit certain conditions. But in a lot of cases, those techniques are no longer possible. Um, so I missed a question there. Uh, I guess that defines the art of binary exploitation. Yeah, binary exploitation is exactly what I'm primarily talking about. I mean, we we talked about um, uh, a little bit of crypto or, or smart contract and blockchain hacking a little bit ago. So I don't, I absolutely don't want this stream to be only uh, binary exploitation. Like I know that I said early on when I started this stream, I wanted to be more advanced, but I'm definitely going to have some talks that aren't always advanced. Like last week I had a red team talk, which is was really cool and interesting stuff and useful tip, tips and tricks, but that wasn't super like, you know, advanced. Um, so I, I definitely want to have a mixture, but the binary exploitation, we've been doing it for so long. And I've mentioned this a couple of times as well, where if, if you throw hundreds of thousands of people and brains and smart people at problems, hopefully they start to get solved. And that's exactly what's happened. So the ability to do exploitation in the same way we used to has gotten, has changed a lot. It's gotten a lot harder. Now, I always say you still need to understand all the foundations. You still should go and, and read the uh, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit from LF1 back from 1990 something, because that's the foundations on which all these principles and these security models and such, these controls, these mitigations are built on. They're built on those things. So you need to understand the foundation. We're not gonna go and move to Rust overnight where a lot of these problems get solved. There's still a lot of application development and operating system development being done in C and C++, Objective-C, Assembly. So I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole. Let's go back to the heap here. So I've got the wonderful paint up. Now I'm gonna draw up. We just talked about a, a couple things. One was, how does memory management work from like a high level? Like what frees memory? What manages memory on the heap? And when is it needed? Well, like if you instantiate an instance of a class, so you're doing object-oriented programming and you instantiate an instance of a class, that object typically, like I use the old example that you learn in like university. There's a dog class or some kind of animal class. Let's say it's a dog class. And, and from this dog class, you can instantiate an instance, a new dog. And you can choose attributes like the breed of the dog, uh, gender of the dog, the fur color of the dog, things like that. And then you've got methods or functions that can travel around with this animal. So if I instantiate, instantiate an instance of a dog, I can say, I want to choose it to be a golden retriever and I want it to be um, white or yellow in color and I want it to have whatever else, right? And then the functions are going to be like sit, and speak and lay down, roll over. So I can say, I'm gonna instantiate an instance of the class. I'm gonna name it Fluffy, why not? And then I'll say Fluffy, which is the object dot method sit. And then I can, I can have that action performed against that specific instance of, of the dog. And we can just you know do this all day long. But with that, it's different than just a single function. These functions now are traveling around with an instance of that class. And so when we're dealing with object management, when does that object get freed? And I just went into a couple examples of ways we can do that. Smart pointers is one way, or we could do it manually, or we could terminate the whole process. Some uh, programming languages have garbage collection, like JavaScript, for example. 
the garbage, you shouldn't ever have to call garbage collection. It's supposed to do its job. You're supposed to let it do its thing, but you can. And a lot of uh, you have to free and type confusion type exploits. You would often see garbage collector being called or collect garbage function because we're trying to force anything that needs to be given back to the heat manager to happen. So let me draw out a basic um, chunk. Now, we're talking about Linux today. We can do Windows on another day. But I'm going to start. There's a bunch of different examples of memory allocators out there. Um, an old example would be DL Malik, typing out on the screen, or PT Malik 2. That's still the most common one you'll see on a standard Linux system is PT Malik 2. That was a successor to, to DL, Doug Lee's Malik. And then you've got JE Malik, which is Jason Evans Malik. You've got TC Malik, which is Google's thread caching Malik. You've got PHK Malik. So there's, there's a bunch of these things. We can keep listing them out. So the question is like, well, when would we choose to use one over the other? And do you have that option? Can you choose to compile with a certain Malik implementation? So Malik in itself is a function. That's the memory allocation function. You would use on Linux something like SBRK or MMAP to either map new memory and map something into that space or load something into that space. Or you can you can create like a whole new heap. On, on Linux, we typically call the, the, the default process heap. You always hear on Windows, the process heap, right? The default process heap would be the main arena. And then when we move past something like the old malloc implementations like Doug Lee's malloc, we get into, so because Doug Lee's malloc didn't support threading. PT malloc 2, I think it stands for per thread malloc, um, allows for threading. So it's, it's heavily based on and derived from the concepts in DL malloc, but it supports threading. So then you can get more complex and you can say, okay, well, if we don't want to deal with like a universal mutex, which slows things down, we can maybe give each thread its own arena, its own heap. And, and not only that, we can give it its own like fast bins, which we'll call, we'll call that um, uh, Tcash. So every thread can get its basically its own fast bins, which is more like the front end allocator. We haven't talked about that concept yet. That's a problem with talking about the heap. It's big, right? And you have something known as the back end heap. And then you got the front end heap. We're talking about traditional Linux heap management right now. The front end heap was the fast bins and the back end was just a doubly linked back end heap. On Windows, this would be the look aside list would be the old front end allocator, which is now the low fragmentation heap or the segment heap. And then you've got the back end doubly linked free list. There's a rule on the heap that says no two free chunks should be, and a chunk is just an allocation of memory on the heap. No two free chunks should be side by side and and both free. We coalesce them. We merge them into a single chunk to reduce fragmentation. On the heap, you want to reduce fragmentation. With the exception, the front end allocation, the front end allocators, we don't worry about fragmentation. I'll give a reasoning for that. And I will just because I feel like I have to kind of bounce back and forth between Linux and Windows at times. Um, Low fragmentation heap on Windows that came out and effectively went into use on Vista, Windows Vista, and it replaced the old look aside list. The problem there was multiple problems with the look aside list, but one problem was it was a singly linked, non coalescing heap, basically that, well not heap but heap management that um, allowed for some simple vulnerabilities to be exploited. Like there's. There's two primary heap vulnerability types that we can go after. There's metadata attacks going after kind of the, the structures on the heap, the way in which the heap is managed, the architectural type things. And then there's application data attacks like use after free where we overwrite a V pointer in an object or we, we replace a freed object with a malicious object with a malicious V pointer. That's going after like the application data itself as where the metadata attacks is going after, again, the structures, the, the way in which the heap is managed and things like that. So we'll, we'll talk about both a bit here today, but I'm gonna spend some time with about the structures. So 
with the front end allocator, I was just explaining, you got look aside lists on Windows and LFH. You've got on, on Linux, you've got Tcash bins, you've got um, uh, fast bins. And the idea about the front end allocators is that we're not going to worry about fragmentation because they're servicing commonly used chunk sizes or really small chunk sizes. And I'll give you an example. On, on a browser, let's say, inside a browser, let's say you're looking at Chrome or, or Internet Explorer or whatever, um, Safari, each browser has its own features. And there are common objects that are used in a web page, on a web page and in a browser, like uh, div, span, title, button, table. Those are all common elements with HTML, right? When you, when you go and you uh, use JavaScript or HTML to create one of these objects, those are like the high level languages that are actually talking to the low level language, which in this case would be C++, or maybe Rust is being used depending on the browser, but let's say C++. So we make a call down on JavaScript, you would see something like create object. And we would say something like, I want to create a, a button, create element, whatever the function is, right? So when we do that, is JavaScript actually creating the element? No, it is a C++ class that's doing it. So down at the C++ level, there would be a class, let's say MS HTML or Edge HTML, and then bang, that's that's the, the library name, Edge HTML.dll, bang, the, the class name, in this case would be C button, colon, colon, what function? Create element. So now you are going to a library, to a class, to a function, because in JavaScript, you wanted to create a button. So you've got at the lower C++ level, this function in this class that's being called inside that function is going to be a call to heap alloc, if we're talking about Windows. What needs to be passed to the heap alloc function? The, the heap that you want to allocate it on, maybe it's G isolated heap if you're using that mitigation. So the heap and then the, the size argument, where's the size argument coming from? That's coming automatically. You don't have control over it. That's coming statically from the size of that specific object being a button in a browser and it's going to be static and that's going to be pushed as an argument. And then you're going to have a DW flags argument, maybe or something like that. So what my point is, is that every time you call and create a button, it's going to be the same size. You have no control over it. Same thing with the span, same thing with the, the div. And you're probably thinking, what is my point? I'm getting to that. My point is that that means it's going to be a commonly used chunk size. Get my point now? That's a common, if, if the button is an HTML element that's commonly used as you use a browser to navigate the web, which it is, or a span or a div, they all have their own specific sizes. That means it's a good candidate to be serviced by the front end allocator because we don't have to worry about fragmentation because it's always being requested. We're saying alloc free, alloc free, alloc free that size over and over again. So we're not worried about fragmentation because we're servicing that size all the time. On Originally on the, the low fragmentation heap on Windows, it was 18 consecutive requests for a specific size is what results in that size being uh, triggered, but by LFH being triggered to service that size. That's not the case anymore. Um, it was segment heap. LFH is automatically on and, and servicing it doesn't require that 18 consecutive allocation thing anymore, depending on the version. So hopefully you get my point there. I'm giving you an example as to why we would use a front end allocator versus a back end allocator to service a request. Because normally we care about fragmentation on the heap, but if it's a common chunk size, maybe we don't. Now on Linux, a lot of times it's not determined by commonly 
requested sizes. It's determined by smaller chunk sizes are serviced by the front end allocator. If there's a chunk in there, sometimes there's no chunk in a front end allocator. The bins that are there, sometimes they're empty. So then you've got to go to the back end allocator and see if anybody else can help you out. There are so many ways in which we can optimize the heap to make its service requests faster, but it often comes with security considerations. I'll give you an example. It's probably easier and takes less code to service chunk requests using LIFO. Last in, first out. You just got freed, I'm sending you right back out because someone asked for a memory allocation. That's quick. And in a lot of cases, like on that, that's how it used to be on Windows. And now it's randomly allocated from the heap, from the bins, because random allocation makes it less determinist, you know, it's not as deterministic. It's not as um, easy to know where your things are. Or if you want a specific memory address to be allocated because you freed something there, it's less likely to happen if it's randomly servicing allocations from the free lists. So that's gonna be a little bit more code to make that happen. I was just gonna say something and it slipped my mind, but it'll come back to me. So on the back end, let's think here again. On the back end, we've got this concept uh, known as, as bins, and we've got typically 127 or 128 bins. It depends on the malloc implementation. Now, on Windows, you don't get to choose. It's chosen for you. You have no choice. On Linux, depending on the operating system and what you've got on your system, you might be able to use a specific heap manager or malloc implementation. Um, and depending on that malloc implementation, different features and different things are going to happen. A lot of these, again, concepts are derived from DL malloc, which is Doug Lee's malloc implementation. And what that said was there were 127 or 128 bins, depending on versions, where you've got bin zero, which typically services chunk sizes that don't have a home, like really large chunk sizes. And we typically index the chunk sizes into bins so that things are nice and neat. And let me draw a quick picture here or to attempt to. All right. So, um, I'm going to try and just draw a couple things out. Let's say we've got, I'll use a Windows example because Windows made it nice and neat originally on the back end allocator. So you've got bin zero, and these are the bins. And then you've got bin one, and then bin two, three, and I'll just put dot, 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 all the way up to bin 127. And the way Windows did it is they had something called the block size and the block size equals eight. And you multiply the block size by the bin number and that's what size chunks go in that bin. And think of the bin as being a free list. It's a doubly linked free list with forward and backward pointers. And the idea is that if we've got some chunks out here, so there's one chunk, there's another chunk, and then there's our last chunk on this list. So I'm saying we've got three chunks on this list. Each one of these free lists or these free chunks is gonna have a pointer to the next one. And then it's gonna have a pointer back to the prior. And that's by design. I know my, my writing is terrible, but you get the point. These are the forward pointers or the F links and these are the backward pointers. So if you were to go into bin number one on a Windows system on a heap, it would be eight byte chunks are stored inside this free list associated with bin one. Bin two, so these would be eight byte chunks. Bin two, well, two times eight, 16 byte chunks. So maybe this one only has one chunk available. And this one is 16 byte chunks. If I can spell correctly. And then bin three would be 24 byte, that's nobody in there, all the way up to bin 127, which would hold 1,016 byte chunks. And then anything that's 1K or greater goes into bin zero. 1K plus goes in bin zero. Now this is the back end allocator. And 
what they did along the line at some point is they said, okay, well, let's not have the, if you're the very last chunk, let's not have you point back to what's called the sentinel node, which is kind of like this, um, each bin is going to have like a little metadata that is like the root or sentinel node of that specific free list. And it's simply just a way to point back. We want to make it circular. So it used to be that the very last chunk on a free list of a bin would just point back to the sentinel node, which would point back to the first chunk to make it all circular. But at some point they said, well, let's make it so like the last chunk on the bin could potentially, or free list could potentially point to another free list to make speed up the allocation request. Let's make it so the very first chunk on the free list didn't point back to the sentinel node, but instead, pointed back to a counter and that counter was keeping track of how many consecutive or how many allocation requests came in for that chunk size because then there's going to be an indicator in there that once it hits 18 we enable low fragmentation heap for that specific chunk size so that's what i mean but i'm saying bins and free lists on the back end allocator that's kind of what's happening and it's very similar it's the same thing on linux like they're they're all very similar um, as we move into more modern versions of glibc, that's when things like tcash comes out, as I mentioned, where it's, uh, every thread gets its own front end allocators. And there's a certain number of chunks that are stored inside a tcash bin. By default, I think it's seven, but you can change that and recompile it if you want. And it's it's to service those, those um, smaller chunk sizes that are commonly used. And when you run out, if you don't have anything left in a Tcash bin, then you got to go and look at the back end. But there's also other things like on more modern glibc implementations. You've got this uh, this process, not processes in like a, a process with a PID, a, a process that occurs inside the heat management that says first fit behavior. It says if you're a chunk that gets freed, then there's going to be one shot to as the next service request comes in, the next alloc request comes in, whatever chunk just got freed is put into this um, temporary bin that gets first fit behavior that says, go ahead and use me first. So let's say that we freed a chunk that's 100 bytes and that goes into that bin that's dealing with the first fit behavior. Then it says an alloc request, a malloc request comes in for 60 bytes. Well, 100 bytes is way more than what we just requested. So we would split that chunk that's in the unsorted bin with that first fit behavior, and we'd return back a pointer to the 60 byte allocation that was requested. But then we would take the remainder and put it in the corresponding bin that it should go into, which is indexed based on its size. Now, I'm not saying anything as standard because each malloc implementation is different in the way that it manages these bins and what sizes go into these bins. Some sizes are grouped together into bins and some of them, like I just showed you on Windows, is very specific. You multiply the bin number by the block size. And then when you get into really large heap requests, like on Windows, you're using different functions than you would normally do for a memory allocation request. So. I know I'm kind of jumping around here between operating systems, but it's just, it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's complex, but it, it does get complex, but it's just different between each of these. And you've really got to, if you're doing heap debugging, you've got to spend a lot of time understanding which malloc implementation is being used. Now let's go ahead and draw a basic structure of a chunk. Now I'm going to start with the old structure that was DL malloc. On DL malloc, Let's say that we did a malloc call for 80 bytes. So there's an 80 byte chunk request comes in. There's in the structure, two blocks of metadata at the top and they're each four bytes. The first one is the previous size field and the next one is the size field. So this one here is the previous size field. And the next one here, is a size field. Now, the rule is that the previous size field is always going to be zero unless the adjacent chunk and lower memory is not in use. 
We'll get back to that. But just know that the previous size field of a chunk, when we're talking about DL malloc, is always going to be zero unless the adjacent chunk in lower memory is free. The size field, you would think that the size field would hold the size that we requested. And it does, but it pads it out so that it has control of the three least significant bits. And that's an important thing to note. So let's say we request 80 bytes. What's 80 bytes in hexadecimal? Right, 16 times whatever. I'm not even, I know I'll mess it up if I try to do it in my head. Again, this is an old Windows 7 box that I'm using because all my Win 10 and 11 boxes are, or and my Linux boxes are tied up with a fuzzing farm right now at the moment. So if we go in here and say programmer and we type in in decimal 80, we get hexadecimal 50. So what we would expect to see in here is five zero. In fact, it should be zero 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 five zero. But it's not going to be that. It's going to be padded out typically to the next double word boundary so that it has control over the three least significant bits. So if we were actually going to create a second copy of this just to show the structure, it would look like this. We'd have the previous size field here. And then we'd have the size, which is correct, but the three least significant bits are special. These are flags. On Windows, there is a flags block inside the metadata or flags field inside the metadata that is reserved specifically for flags. On Linux, on DL malloc and PT malloc 2, the three least significant bits are the flags. That's the flags field. And you've got three different ones. We've got um, the bottom one is going to be the previous in use field. So I'll just put P here for previous in use. And then the next one over is going to be M for is it N mapped? And the next one's going to be is main arena. So you can, you can remember that with the initials AMP, A-M-P, like amplifier. If you want to memorize that, AMP is the order. It's is main arena, is M mapped, and is the previous and use bit set. The one we tip for basic heap metadata exploitation, if you're looking back at things like uh, abusing free lists and abusing the unlink or front link macros, then you care about the, the least significant bit. Because this bit, if it's on, so if it's a one, if it's a one, that means that the chunk in previous memory, in lower memory, adjacent, is in use. And if it's a zero, that means that the chunk in adjacent lower memory is not in use. And that it is an indicator, it's a flag that is checked by the free function. Because if this block of memory, if this chunk of memory gets freed, the free function is going to check that least significant bit of the size field to see if it's on or off. And if it's off, if it's a zero, that's an indicator, it's a flag to tell free that the lower chunk in memory adjacent is also free. And you're going to coalesce, you're going to merge those two chunks together. Because remember, the rule on the heap is that no two free chunks can be side by side and free. We coalesce them, we merge them. So let's, let's lay this out in something that looks better. I'm going to say here's the heap. And let's put a couple free chunk or a couple chunks side by side. So let's say there's four chunks here. And I'm going to change the color from black. Whoops, that didn't work out. So that we know what we're talking. Actually, you know what's better than that? If we do this to indicate. So the the lines that I'm drawing that go out of bounds means that that's the chunk separator. And then inside, we've got these fields. And remember, it's the, the previous size field and the size field of the first two double words. 
or quad words if you're 64 bit. So we know that this is, I'll just put P for previous in use. That's what that means. And then this is the size field. So P S P S P S. Now this is always going to be zero if the chunk in adjacent lower memory is um, in use. That also means the size. Remember those three least significant bits here. Amp, A-M-P. That is, is main arena, is M mapped, and is a previous in use bit set. The one we care about is the bottom one. So they're all gonna be one. The least significant bit is going to be one because all these chunks are in use in my example. And then the data portion of the chunk is variable length, right? Because we don't know how many bytes somebody asked for. So that part's variable, but the structure is not. Structure is always the same size. Now this is four chunks side by side, side of memory and they're, they're all happy. Now let's say for example, the free function gets called on a couple of these and I'm gonna indicate that by a nice bright color here. So those two chunks on the outside, those are all both free now. So since they're free, they're gonna get this new metadata called a forward pointer and a backward pointer. So if we were to do that, it uses the first two double words or quad words, depending if it's 32 or 64 bit, of the old data to store these new pointers. So that's gonna be FD for forward pointer and BK for backward pointer. Over here, FD and BK. And the forward pointer is gonna point down to this guy. So we point down to this one. And this guy's backward pointer is gonna point back to this chunk. They're doubly linked. So the forward pointer on the end here is gonna point somewhere and the backward pointer here is gonna point back somewhere. It's gonna to point to the sentinel nodes that these are the only two free chunks. So um, you see how that looks? We've got two chunks in use in the middle and we've got two free chunks on the outside. Now, what also needs to change here is when we freed this chunk on the left, free function is gonna go into the next chunk over. It's gonna clear that previous in use bit. And it's also going to change the previous size field to hold the size of that chunk. Let's just say it's a uh, 64. So 64, so you see what we did now, free came in, it turned off the previous in use bit of the chunk next to it on the right. And it also took the size of the chunk that got freed on the left and wrote that into the previous in use field. Because the rule is, let's say now that the free function gets called on this guy, the free function is gonna check that previous in use bit and it's gonna see that it's a zero. And what it's gonna do is coalesce these two chunks into one big chunk. So these two chunks will merge together. Let me actually get rid of this so it's accurate. It is going to merge all that together. So now we've got one big chunk. That's the behavior on the backend allocator because that rule again is no two free chunks are allowed to be side by side. If we went and freed this chunk on the right here that's currently in use, it would merge them all together. If we're dealing with the front end allocator, we're not going to do it like this. Now, a big difference here. Well, it's not a huge difference, but it's something important to note. We were just talking about DL malloc. And with DL malloc, I said that the chunk metadata is always the case where you've got the size field and the previous, uh, the previous size field and the size field. So this on the top would be the previous size field. And then this one would be the size field. That's DL malloc. With PT malloc 2, it's not the case. The previous size field doesn't exist until it needs to. 
So that would be the metadata and chunk structure, just a size field. It still uses the AMP concept for is main arena, is mmap, and previous size field. But there is no previous size or previous and use bit. But there is no previous size field unless until there needs to be. So if we were to flip this over and rotate it, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to just rotate this. So if that's what we look like now, and let's say that there's a chunk here, And it also has a size field. Now, if this chunk on the left is freed, then all of a sudden, this new field is created at the last quad word of data at the end here. And that is the previous size field. So it doesn't exist until it needs to be, until it needs to be there. That's to save space because if we do it the old way, that's just a wasted double word or quad word that we could have been using because we don't need the previous size field until that chunk is freed. And then when it's freed, the last double or quad word becomes the previous size field. A interesting vulnerability gets created by doing it this way, which is pretty funny. If you've got something like an off by one vulnerability, hence the streamcast name, the webcast name. If you've got an off by one vulnerability, the fact that there is no previous size field until it's needed allows you to potentially overwrite one more byte than you should be able to write. And you can actually change the size of an adjacent chunk due to an off by one vulnerability which is kind of neat. And you can do things like falsely enlarging a chunk and forcing it to go back to the wrong bin. And that can result in all kinds of problems that allow for exploitation. It actually allows for code execution in some cases. We go over that in the 760 course that I teach. Um, what we do is we exploit an off by one vulnerability to enlarge a chunk on the heap, sending it back to the wrong tcache bin and then we do some allocations that allow us to overwrite other chunk data because of the falsely enlarged chunk due to the off by one vulnerability. And that allows us to overwrite pointers like to free hook or other hooking opportunities. There are debugging hook functions for developers to use. And by doing a little trick, we can get code execution due to an off by one vulnerability due to the way PT malloc does its structures. So that would be going after heap metadata as opposed to heap application data. Now it's already been almost an hour and that, which is insane because I haven't covered nearly as much as I wanted to. What I want to do is cover one more thing, which is I want, I'm going to write a little program that calls malloc and free. And I want to show you some of the internals and why a debugging tool like Jeff or um, PETA and other ones, why they're so useful. So let's go over here to VMware. And I've just got a random Ubuntu system here. So I'm going to uh, make a little folder here called heap test. Let's go in there. And I'm going to create a program with the same name, heap test.c, vim heap test.c. And we are going to write a little C program. So include. Um, what do we need here? We need string.h and we also need standard IO, right? No standard lib. All right, so now we're gonna do int main. We'll do our int argc. Um, just because I like to explain what's going on here. If you're not familiar with argc and argv, yeah, thanks, Noel. <laughs> yeah, I know 
that's the thing. I can get, I can go all day long, but uh, yeah, I got other work to do too. But um, so argc is the argument counter, and argv is the argument vector. So basically, if you are a program that wants command line arguments, you need to use this because there's a counter and the vector. So arg argv zero is always the program name itself. Argv one would be the first argument we pass in. And since I'm going to use something like stir copy to copy data into the heap, then I need this argument vector. So that's why it's there. All right, so now that we're inside here, let's do a char pointer to, we'll call it buff one, and we'll do another one, char pointer to buff two. Maybe one uh, session we'll talk about the craziness of pointers in C and C++, especially C++. So buff one, um, char star, what are we gonna do here? We're gonna do a malloc. Uh, let's just do a 100 byte malloc. And then we'll do a, let's do a mem set to make it nice and clean. Um, a mem set is going to make it a lot easier for you to see where the heap metadata is and where the data itself is at. All right, so we're gonna mem set that buff one to a hundred capital A's. And then we're gonna do, actually shoot, I need this to be buff one and this down here to be buff two. Same thing, char star malloc. 100 bytes, and then we are going to do mem set into buffer two, zero x four two for capital B in that one. And I'm gonna close that out. Um, let's now, wait, I don't need, I'm not gonna do a stir copy yet, am I? Now let's leave stir copy out of it right now. We don't need to copy data in. All I wanna do is at this point, we can add that later if we want. I wanna create the heaps, do the allocations, mem set them to A's and B's, and then I wanna free. I want to show you what happens when you actually free these things. So free buff one and then free buff two. And then we'll do an exit zero and then we'll just close out. Simple little program, right? Just making sure we're using the heap. And then we will GCC heap test.c heap test. Cool. Compiles. That's good. Now let's go debug it. So if we run the program, it's not going to do anything, right? It's, it doesn't do anything interesting. So let's go inside a debugger. So GDB heap test. And I've got Jeff in here. So Jeff is an extension that brings along with it lots of cool features and tools that we want in relation to doing things like debugging and exploit development and other nice things. So we'll disassemble the main function. And inside the main function, you can see mem set and malix, and you see the free calls down here and then the exit. So pretty self-explanatory. I'm gonna set a breakpoint on each call to free. So the first call to free is right there. By the way, if you don't know what PLT means, that means it's dynamically linked, procedural linkage table. Instead of statically compiling it, we're relying on the C libraries to be loaded and utilize them from that way. So if you do an info functions, for example, and you see in here that there's some functions like main that don't say at PLT, but other ones do. Those are the dynamically linked um, dependencies. So disassemble main, I'm gonna set a breakpoint on each call to free. So we'll say break pointer because we're going to pass it a symbol name plus an offset. You need to use the asterisk. So main plus offset, you can see 94 right there and 106. So plus 94 and plus 106. So now I've got a two breakpoint set. Info break, you can see them right there. Um, by the way, these offsets, because x86, x64 uh, is a very dense instruction set that has variable length instructions like 0 through 15 or 1 through 15, the offsets aren't going to be aligned like with other architectures like um, ARM, for example, you've got ARP thumb instructions and then regular instructions are either two bytes or four bytes aligned. They're, they're not variable length like you have with x86 or x64. If you say disassemble slash R main, you can see the actual opcodes and see how some instructions are like three byte opcodes, some are longer. So it's variable length. That's why these offsets are important. So I've got the two breakpoints set. So we're just going to say run. And we hit the first breakpoint. You can see right there. It says the reason we're stopped is due to a breakpoint. 
So a really cool thing that Jeff brings along with it for heap debugging, we can say heap chunks. And it shows us all the chunks that are currently out there. You've got the top chunk. This is called the wilderness chunk. It borders the unknown because um, they call it the wilderness chunk because um, I guess it's a bunch of monkeys out there on the heap that's unmapped and it's crazy, right? If you get to the point where you don't have any memory left and the only allocation left is the top chunk, it's time to get more memory to extend the heap or whatever. Um, so you can see right there the, the mem sets and why it's really cool to do that because we can see the A's and the B's. We can see the size. Notice that the size is greater than 100. 100 would be hex 64, but this is hex 70. So it's been padded out so that it can have control over the least significant bits. And notice it says the flags that are on, only the previous in use bit is on right now. So it's telling us what flags are on. Now, if we wanna look at the chunk, so this is the pointer right here on the left to the actual chunk. So if we grab that and say X for examine slash, we'll just do 20 GX, 20 is the size. G means giant for quad word, X means in hexadecimal and starting at that address. And there you can see it dumps out for us our data. And we can see we've dumped so much out, we've actually made it to the second chunk that's contiguous. I'm not seeing the metadata for this chunk though. So if I say minus eight, eight bytes, we can see there's the size field now. And notice that it's got a one on the end because that's the previous in use bit that's set. If it's an odd, then it's on. If it's, if it's even, then it's a zero and it's off. So we can see the start of that. There is no previous size field right now because both of these chunks are in use. Now, what I wanna show you is we've, we've hit a breakpoint on the first call to free. So if we look at the stack and say X slash four GX dollar sign RSP, this is what's stored on the stack right now. Now, some functions that we call, we pass arguments on the stack some functions, we actually put them in the, into the registers, right? On 32-bit, we didn't have 16 general purpose registers. We only had eight. On 64-bit, we got R8 through R15, so an additional eight general purpose registers. So some function calls in 64-bit, we're going to utilize the registers instead of pushing arguments on the stack because it's safer to do that. Writing arguments on the stack makes it potential uh, overflow opportunities if there is a buffer overflow. At least that's one reason. So what I want to do then is you can see right here that FF or 555 is whatever, 9258 shows us the previous or, or the size field. And down here you can see 5555-9260. So 9258-9260. 9260 gets us to the start of the data portion. So you can see the pointer that's being passed to free. So we, if we wanna correlate that, we can actually say something like x slash four gx, and then int star star. I know it's annoying syntax, but um, it's just the way it is. Um, I think I need another guy here. And then uh, dollar sign RSP plus that would be 816 offset 16 and close that out. Cannot access memory at 41414141. So let's do a single star. So what it's trying to do is deref or, or to go two depths. We're going pointer pointer. So it's actually trying to go into what's stored in that chunk, which are the A's and it's trying to go there. So if we remove one of these asterisks, then we should get the, a better result. So now we're just looking at the pointer that's stored in the stack pointer offset 16 on the stack and we're just dumping what's there pointer pointer said don't dump what's there dump what's there that's what, what it's pointing to there like you know it gets confusing you're nesting pointers here so um all right free has been called or no it's not been called we are now on the breakpoint that's about to call free you can see there on the bottom right and you can see the arguments it's getting so it's going to free this chunk. Now, when we free it, some new thing should appear. Here's the chunk right now, and it's storing A's. When it gets freed, this should become the forward pointer, and this should become the backward pointer. We should see those changes. So I'm going to say NI 
for next instruction. So that means step over the call to free. So you can see up here that we are no longer on the call to free, but we are at the instruction after free. We didn't go into the free function. We went to the next instruction. If we did SI for step into, we've gone into the free function. So now let's take a look at the heap and what's stored there. So see how now we've got this uh, pointer here. This pointer should point to either metadata or if there's another free chunk. There isn't another free chunk yet. We haven't hit the second call to free. So this is pointing somewhere else, probably to like the Sentinel node. Now it depends on the malloc implementation. It's different with more modern versions of libc, like what we're looking at here, in the way in which each uh, thread gets its own like arena. And, and that's why you're not seeing the is main arena flag on because we're not in the main arena because every thread gets its own arena. So we're not part of the default process heap here. So when I go to the second call to free, so if I say C for continue, now we're on the second call to free. Now look at what we just looked at. That's what it looks like right now. I'm gonna say next instruction. So now we stepped over the second call to free. Let's see if that changes now. So this one looks the same, which makes sense, but the other block should now point back to this free block because now we've got two free chunks. So if we look at the other one, heap chunks, and we were looking at this top one, let's look at the bottom one now. And we say uh, x slash 20 GX, paste that in. Yeah, so see how it points back to the other one. So here's that first chunk and see how it's forward pointer now in the second chunk points back to the first chunk. And then the second one points back to that Sentinel node. So now the other chunk should point to this chunk, to D0. Let's see if it does. Oddly enough, it is not. So this, this should be the forward pointer and it's zeros right now, which I find very interesting. I'm not sure why that's the case. That is neat though, because you can see this is the second chunk right down here at the bottom and it points back to this first chunk to six zero, which is right up here at the top. But the first chunk, the backward pointer points to the Sentinel, but the forward pointer was not updated to point to the second one. I'm gonna have to go find, uh, figure that out because let me show you another example why that's a little bit different. If I go back to one of the programs we debug in class, which is um, compiled with an old version of glibc. So if we go into heap two and I say, this is a 32 bit example. And we say uh, gdb heap two and then heap chunks, no debugging session. Okay, great. So let's say run. Let's break first, disassemble main, no symbol table loaded, oh great. Info functions, if I can type. So we can see that um, stir copy is called, freeze called. I'm gonna set a breakpoint on the uh, procedure language table entry for free, cause that'll work too. So let's grab that address and say break on that. And then go ahead and run. Uh, once an argument. So we hit on the call to free. Now let's look at heap chunks. Uh, it's not working because it's an older version of libc. And I bet you that Jeff does not understand DL malloc because probably there's no point. Now I'm going to say something here that's kind of interesting. What I just said was heap chunks probably isn't working right now because maybe Jeff was not written to understand DL malloc because it's an older heap manager, but it does understand PT malloc. Now I'm not hundred percent on that, but that's probably what it is. But the thing it made me think of is there are some people out there who get paid to port tools and exploits to really obscure versions of Linux, because there are a lot of environments out there, industrial control environments, or take, for example, North Korea has got its own, uh, its own operating system. I was just talking to uh, 
a coworker of mine about this a couple of days ago. Um, it, maybe you got a copy of that and you want to port some tools over to work on a more obscure version of Linux. Like there's a lot of uh, interesting things you can do there. Like I try to run Nmap on some old version of SCO Unix or Dynix and it didn't work. Well, yeah, that's because it was never written to run on those older platforms. So the ability to port more modern tools onto older, obscure Linux operating systems is actually a pretty cool thing. So either way, we are here now on a call to free. We're in the procedure linkage table. All good here. What I want to see are the chunks. Now, let me think about this for a moment. We should be able to see in the call stack the pointers to the heap. Let's do that. X slash 20 WX, because now we're on 32-bit and dollar sign ESP. So one of these, probably this one, should be the pointer to the chunk. So let's say X slash 20 WX, paste that in. Nope, not that one. Maybe it's the other one. A418, A418. There we go. So now we're pointing to a chunk of memory that was memset with Cs, as you can see here. So if we subtract eight bytes from that, you can see the previous size field and the size field because with DL malloc, the previous size field is always there. With PT malloc, it's not there till it's needed after the chunk gets freed. So what I wanna show here is that when this chunk gets freed, this will be the forward pointer, this will be the backward pointer. So I'm gonna say next instruction and we're still at free in the PLT. Let's take a look if that's changed yet. Nope, let's say next instruction at free at PLT, next instruction. Let's take a look now. Nope, next instruction. Jump double word pointer. Right now, I think we're jumping to the pointer inside the global offset table, which should be the real free function. So next instruction. Now let's take a look. Oh, this is killing me. I think it's going to link right now. That's what's going on. It's going through the dynamic linking process and I don't really feel like watching that. So let's say, actually, if I let it continue, it's gonna break on the next call to free and this will automatically be changed. Perfect, there we go. So now this is the first chunk that got freed. Notice that it points to these, the forward pointer and the backward pointer, both point to these crazy addresses. Now this is before TC malloc. This is before PT malloc. This is old DL malloc. So this is absolutely pointing to the Sentinel node. If we go and grab this address and say examine that address, see how it says main arena plus 92? We're in the main arena now because this is not a case where every thread gets its own uh, arena or heap. So it's just a Sentinel node that points back to itself. See where we are? 804A41. A410, and in the Sentinel node for that bin, it points straight back to the chunk that got freed. Now we're now on a second call to free. So another chunk is being freed. Uh, we can see which one it is by looking on the stack. It is 804A008. So let's grab this and say uh, X slash 20 WX, that address, and you can see Here's the data. So let's go back eight bytes to see the metadata. Here is the previous size field, the size field, forward and backward pointers are about to be written. So let's do a check here. Let me look at the return pointer. This is gonna be in the function. Symbols are stripped, so that's why it's saying question mark. So that's okay, because we can see the return pointer back to where it's gonna go anyway. So we can just do a little cheat there. X slash 20i or 8i for examine eight instructions. And you can see the ret down here at the bottom. So let's actually break on this address and say continue. Now we're on the breakpoint on the return. You can see that right there. Now let's look at that chunk. All right, so see it's forward pointer. The forward pointer of this chunk points to the earlier chunk that we freed its backward pointer points to the Sentinel node. So if we go and take a look at this chunk now, X slash 20 WX, that chunk's backward or forward pointer points to the Sentinel node, but its backward pointer points up here to the chunk that just got freed. So right now there's two freed chunks and they're pointing to each other 
but then they also are pointing to the Sentinel node since there's only one other free chunk that it can point to. So pretty neat if we look at it that way. So what I'm just showing is a little bit of heap debugging where we can see that when a chunk of memory gets freed, that these uh, pointers and such get updated. Also, the previous in use bit would be updated on an adjacent chunk. Like these chunks are probably quite large, but let's go and take this address and let's jump down to the next chunk. So x slash 20 wx on that address. And let's just keep going down. And now we get down to another chunk. So see how this one says 208 instead of 209? Because when free, freed the chunk above it, it went in and cleared out the previous in use bit. And the reason it does that is so if this chunk down on the bottom ever gets freed, because that previous in use bit is off, it'll coalesce it with the chunk above it. That's the purpose of that. You can also see that it's a previous size field and size field. The previous size field is actually populated now instead of zeros because what free is gonna do, free is gonna come in, it's gonna look at this chunk and it's gonna say, look at the least significant bit. Is it on or off? Well, in this case, it's off because it's an even number. Since it's off, free knows it needs to coalesce. So then it's gonna go back to the previous size field. It's gonna use that value and subtract from it to get to the top of that chunk so it can merge the two together. That's what it wants to do. Now, since stir copy is being used here, there's clearly a heap overflow condition. For example, if we wanna say delete break and we say uh, run, and then this one wants an argument, right? Command line argument, so backtick. Python minus C print A times 1,000 should be enough. See how we get a seg fault. We get a crash inside int free. So there's a vulnerability. What we did was we overwrote chunk metadata. So when the free function tries to go in and do its thing, it gets confused. Look at the instruction we're at right now. It says... It tried to move into EAX, dereference ECX plus four. Well, what's an ECX? Info reg ECX. This value is inside ECX. And it tried to go to there plus four and move what's there into EAX. Well, this is probably unmapped memory. Let's try to take a look at it. So if I say copy that and we say examine four double words of memory at that address, cannot access memory because it's not mapped. Um, VM proc, was that gonna work here? No, that was that VM map. Yeah, there we go. So here's the memory mapping, 4945. See how that's not allocated? So right here's the gap. This is the wilderness basically between this heap address down here and where libraries and such are loaded. And then up top where the stacks are at the very bottom, you can see down here, here's a Linux gate, virtual dynamically linked shared object. There's that big jump from 4.2 to F7 that's unmapped memory. And we're trying to go to that unmapped lo location due to that overflow that we just did. So that is my point that I'm trying to say here. Um, that's, that's probably where we should stop because I've been going for like an hour and 20 minutes and that, you know, that's a lot of information and I'm going kind of fast through stuff. But what I really wanted to show was the chunk structure, how some of the heat management works, what the doubly linked lists are, a little bit about the front end allocator being the fast bins or the T-cache, had little differences between Windows and Linux. And then I wrote a little C program so that we could see on 64-bit some of the allocations and the freeing. And then we just jumped over to a 32-bit example to look at some of the differences. We saw that like in this 32-bit example, when we free, it goes and points to the Sentinel node, but on that 64-bit example with PT Malik 2, since we're, we're not in the main arena, we're in our own arena, and we're using things like Tcash and such, that the forward pointer on the first chunk that got freed didn't get updated to point to the, the other chunk. It just points to zero. And I don't know what the reason for that is. So that's something I'm gonna have to go and look up because I would have assumed that it should have been updated. Something's weird there. but um, there's differences between all these different heap allocators and, you know, it's something that you have to kind of go and, and debug and using tools like Jeff 
is very useful because it's got neat commands like like that. I'll show you one other command real quick. If I quit out of here and we go back to the heap test thing and we say GDB heap test. And I'm going to say break on free and we'll say run. So we break on free here. So before I did heap chunks, no heap section. Interesting, because probably we need to continue to get to a better call to free. Let's try it again. Heap chunks. There we go. Now the chunks are there. The first one is the A's that we mem setted. The second one's the B's that we mem setted. And the other command I'll show you is heap bins. So when you look at heap bins, look at all these bins now. T cache bins, fast bins, unsorted bins, small bins, large bins. That kind of uh, confirms my suspicion that it doesn't understand DL malloc because DL malloc's old and it wasn't written for that because there's probably no point, which maybe give that example of why it's important to like know how to port things over to older operating systems because that's just a whole other thing I don't want to talk about right now. But we can see Tcash bins. So let's go continue to the next call to free and then look at heap bins. See now how there's one in there. A Tcash bin now has a count of one. So automatically that chunk size of hex six zero or 100 bytes or whatever it was that we did um, got put into a Tcash bin available for reallocation. If we fill up this Tcash bin, the next one's gonna go to this unsorted bin and they're gonna get first fit chance to go and utilize what's in there. So all kinds of crazy things happen. Maybe, maybe on a future webcast on the heap, we'll play around more with kind of doing a bunch of allocations, doing a bunch of freeze, seeing how these different bins get filled up and what we might be able to do to abuse some of that stuff. Because there's some neat things we can do with heap grooming and kind of understanding the behavior of all of this. So anyway, that takes us to the end of the stream. I think we're at a good stopping point. Next week, next Friday, I'm really excited. I got uh, Connor McGar is going to be on to talk us through some really cool Windows kernel exploitation stuff. We'll talk about some mitigation bypasses and kind of the state of uh, virtualization-based security and such in the kernel because it's quite hard now. It's always been hard, but it's harder now to do exploitation in the Windows kernel. And we will see why. But on a future webcast, I will definitely jump back into the heap and we can take a look at some uh, some more stuff. But regardless, have a good weekend. Thank you for, for joining here. You would like to see the crazy pointers? Yeah, I think a, a webcast session on pointers on C++ would be a, a fun and confusing one to do. <laughs> so have a great weekend and thanks uh, for joining.